Well, as you can see, it's about time and space. We are all members of that place, and we need to understand a little bit about it if we want to operate in it well. We ask ourselves questions like, do we have enough time? And most people, I think almost everybody would say, I don't have enough time. Is time on your side? Or is time working against you? Well, interestingly enough, it really doesn't do either. But we are so busy in our lives trying to get everything done according to some time frame that we've kind of distorted our lives. And what I wanted to do is show you some techniques that you could use that would allow you to do more things in space of time. One of them is getting organized and, and being able to multitask. And I want to show you a picture of my office where we do that. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I'll be selling those plans to anybody who wants them. But time is an interesting thing. There was a fellow who uh, went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I have very bad news for you. You're going to die. And he said, well, how much time do I have left? And he said, well, 10. He said, 10. What, 10 years, 10 months, 10 weeks? What is it? He said, 10, 9 eight, seven, <laughs> six, five. That's not really enough time. In, in my younger years, when I had more audacity and less brains, I used to teach something called time management. I actually thought you could manage time. But I want to, us to do that tonight. We're going to manage some time. Anybody got a watch with a second hand on it? Take a look at your watch. And what I want you to do is what, look at the second hand and I want you to make it go a little faster. We're going to manage time, right? Make it go faster. Nobody's able to do it. Okay, let me give you an easier one. Let's make it go slower. Hmm. So much for time management. It is not possible at all to manage time. It's unmanageable. It isn't even real. There was another fellow who went to the doctor, and he was told that he only had six months to live. And so he said, well, doctor, is there anything I can do to stretch my time on earth? He said, oh, yes, there's something you can do. He said, you can marry a woman with six children. You can buy a small house and move them all into it. And you can have your in-laws come and stay with you. And he said, well, will that, will that give me more time? He said, that'll be the longest six months you've ever spent. <laughs> May seem longer, not actually longer. It's interesting, we've, up until about 90 or so years ago, the, the scientists and everybody agreed that time was flowing from the past to the future, and it was a nice, even little chunks of minutes and days and hours and all those things. Then came along came Einstein and said, wait a minute, time is not a flow, it is relative to space, that time and space were relative to each other. And he said that if, if you were to get into a rocket ship and fly out into space and go faster and faster, as you approached the speed of sound, or speed of light, that time would actually contract. A person on the rocket going close to the speed of light would experience less time than the person standing on the Earth. That was his basic theory, which has now been proven about 20 years after he said so. And he also said not only would that happen, but the dimensions would change. For example, if you were standing sideways and going uh, faster and faster, you'd actually get narrower. Or if you were going standing head first towards the, the direction you were going, you'd get shorter. Now, all of this has been scientifically proven about the relativity of time and space. In fact, they now use a term of either the space-time or time-space continuum. It is a whole unit that works together. And we need to be aware of the fact that that is the way that science has viewed it for more than 90 years. But it didn't stop there. Along came a guy named Heisenberg. Heisenberg is one of these guys who like to examine little teeny tiny particles. I mean things smaller than, than electrons and neutrons, quarks, little teeny things like that. And he wanted to calculate their speed that they were moving and, and their position. And what he discovered was it was impossible to get an accurate reading on their speed at the same time as their position. You could get an accurate reading on the speed, but their position would be way off. 
It would be an accurate reading on their position, but the, then the speed would be, would be off. And in fact, what he called it was the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It means that you can't really tell where something is. And as that theory developed, that was the beginning part where, where quantum physics came in and has proven things that are so unbelievably different than what we've believed. And yet we're still operating as if quantum physics was not there. And we need to not understand, we don't have to be quantum physicists, you don't need to know how a car works completely to drive one. But you do need to know when the gas gauge goes to empty that you better fill up. And you do need to know when that little red light comes on and says oil that you need to have your oil checked. So we need to know just enough about this stuff so that we can use it to our advantage. Interestingly enough, uh, the Bible says something about time. I think it's in the book of Peter where it says that one day with God is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Even they recognized there was some, something about time, that a day was the same as a thousand years, and a thousand years was the same as a day. Now, they were using the term a thousand. If we were making the same statement today, we would have used millions, because thousand was the biggest, about the biggest number that they had. They didn't think any bigger than 1,000. One fellow finding out about this says, well, now, wait a minute. If a day is like a 1,000 years, a 1,000 years is like a, uh, like a day, I'll bet you a million dollars is like a penny. So I'm going to ask God for a penny, and it'll be a million dollars. So he asked for a penny, and God said, yes, in a day. Again, there is all of this idea of relativity between time and space, it is every place, not just in one. This is uh, from Cabral. You would adjust your conduct and even direct the course of your spirit according to the hours and seasons. Of time, you would make a stream upon whose banks you would sit and watch its flowing. Yet, the timeless in you is aware of life's timelessness and knows that yesterday is but today's memory. And tomorrow is today's dream. If we look at it, we, we will find that things are different than we think. What we have here is that the scientists say that time is relative. The Bible says that time is insignificant. The scientists say that it doesn't matter. Some people say they don't have enough time. Some people say they have times on their hand. And some people have time to kill. Well, what is time? It is not what we thought it was. It is not this stretch of ideas, this stretch of things happening in a sequence. I once saw a little uh, card that said, uh, time is God's way of keeping everything from happening at once. It's not God's way. It's our way. Because while you may think that eternity is a long time, it is not. Eternity is the absence of time. And you're in eternity, and there's only one place in the time continuum where eternity exists, and that's in the present moment. That is the place where, where reality and the idea of time meet, only in the present moment. So let's take a look at this. Lao Tzu said this, Time is a created thing. To say, I don't have enough time, is like saying, I don't want to. Now that blows that excuse out. Next time someone tells you, it's, it really means, I don't want to. You have enough time for anything you choose. You can choose to sit behind the mindless boob tube for hour after hour and let your brain be poisoned. Or you could meditate. Or you could read affirmations. You could at least do like one of our friends does. They have our affirmation cards, and he says, when the commercials come on, I turn them on mute and read the affirmation cards. Well, that's a good use of your time. This little fellow has been a favorite of mine. He comes from Sufi wisdom. His name is Nezrudin. He was a mullah, like a priest, and uh, he was always getting himself in trouble. And one day, he was out in front of his house, on his hands and knees, searching around the dirt in front of the door of his house. And his friend came along and said, uh, 
Mullah, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm looking for my key. So his friend got down on his hands and knees and they looked for the key together. And after a while, a friend said to him, well, when was the last time you saw your key? Where was the last time it was? He said, well, I saw it in the house. He said, then what are we doing looking out here? And the mullah said, there's more light out here. <laughs> We're doing that. We're looking where we think it's obvious that out, the answer is out here someplace, and it is not. None of the answers that you're looking for, none of, nothing that you need is in time space. It's a record of what you're doing, but it is not the source of anything. So Nasruddin will find his key when he looks in the right place. Life, unfortunately, plays a trick on us. There was a policeman uh, who decided he was going to catch some drunks. And there was this one roadhouse out in the country where, where all the guys with trucks went and got drunk, and they closed at 2 o'clock. So he set himself up in the bushes where they couldn't see him with the car all kind of covered up, and he was waiting to get himself a drunk. He knew the place closed at 2 o'clock, and it would be really loaded with him. And about five minutes before two, this guy came stumbling out. I mean, he was as drunk looking as you can imagine, staggering. He went over to a car, tried to fit the key, and it obviously wasn't his car. He couldn't get the door open. He went to a second car. Finally, he got to his car, and he started up, and he took off. Well, the guy thought, I've got this one, and took off after him. About three blocks down the road, he pulled him over, and he said, son, I want to give you a sobriety test. And he said, oh, sure, go right ahead. And he gave him a sobriety test right there on the spot. And his blood alcohol was 0, 0.0, not a drop of alcohol. I can't believe this. He said, you were just as drunk as any person I've ever seen. What happened here? He says, oh, it's all right, officer. Tonight, I was the designated decoy. <laughs> Life has given us a decoy. And that decoy is time itself. We are obsessed with it. And it is nothing but something we have literally made up from keeping everything from happening at once. Let's take a look at this picture. In this, in this uh, slide, there's a big circle. And we're going to call that a circle eternity. And then there is the future. We're moving up in the future. And in the other direction is the past. And we're right there on the circle right at that point we call now. Reality is the circle. And you'll notice that, that the future doesn't touch the circle, and the past doesn't touch the circle, because they are not real. They are memories, and they're hopes and dreams, but they are not the reality. The only place that time touches reality is at that point where we are in, in any given moment. The illusionary gap is where we spend most of our time. Most of your thought is thinking about what happened to you in the past or what might happen to you in the future. That's where our minds is all the time. It's almost never on the only place that it could do us any good, which is right now, right at the present moment. The illusionary gap is where all pain and suffering comes from. You cannot, listen to this carefully, you cannot be suffering in the present moment. It's not possible. Because if you are suffering in the present moment, it's because your mind is in the future or the past. It is not on the moment. And all of your suffering comes from the concentration on either the past or the future. And the farther you are back in the past, the greater the pain and suffering. And the farther you go in the future, the greater the pain and suffering. This is the place where there is no suffering. And as a matter of fact, you can, if you could get your attention down to the exact moment, You'd have no pain at all if you kept it there. It's only when your mind wanders into the future or the past where that pain comes in. Let's take a look at it. Supposing we could eliminate both the future and the past from our thinking and only literally be in the present moment. If we could do that, then we could connect with our core where everything is. Because when you are connected to what's in you, then what's out there is not driving you. It's not creating what's in your reality. Your attention to your own being is what causes the flow of life. Your attention to your own being is what causes the flow of life. The more you're paying attention 
to what is my state of mind now? And if it's not good, I change it to a good state. Am I feeling good and okay about this particular moment? Am I not focused on the future or the past? If you're doing that, you are creating more and more life force. The farther you get out there into the future, the more you worry, or the more you're upset and talking about the past, the less life force that's coming to you. So it is a crucial moment to live in the now. Now let's take a look at how our time and space related to each other, because we live in both. The first three dimensions of space we're kind of familiar with. If we take a, a dot or point and we move it in a direction, it creates what we call a line. Now, if we go perpendicular to that line, it creates what we call a plane. And if we go perpendicular to the plane, it creates what we call a cube, the third dimension. Those are the basic three dimensions. Now, <clears throat> that's easy enough to understand them, but I want to go through it one more time because we're going to go further. We're going to use the same formula from going from the first to the second to the third, and then we're going to jump to the fourth and using the same technique. So if we have a line and another line, they're called, when they cross each other, they're called perpendicular. Here's a statement. All dimensions are perpendicular to the next one. They're perpendicular to each other. The first dimension is perpendicular to the second, which is perpendicular to the third, and so on. Let's look at that in the three dimensions we're familiar with. If you have a point and you move the point, you create a line. But what happens when you move the line itself sideways through space? You create, you create a plane. And what happens when you move the plane through space? You create the cube or the three dimensions. Those are the three dimensions that we know about. It's easy to, to picture those. But how are we going to get to the next one, the fourth one? Time, our space is perpendicular to time. It's the next dimension that's perpendicular. So let's represent it this way. Here we have our little cube that you just saw, only shrunk it down a little bit, our three-dimensional object. And we're going to turn it on its side. So its point is on a line that we call time. And it travels on the line called time. It is perpendicular. Space is perpendicular to time. Not too hard to understand, but then the next question you're going to ask is, that's great, but what is time perpendicular to? Let's take a look at that. Time is perpendicular to mind. Now, if that's true, if that model holds true, something that wants to get from mind has to come from mind into the next lower dimension, which is time, and then from time into one of the other dimensions, and all the way to three, the third dimension. And that's how it is. What comes from mind, comes through time, comes into our being. And there's a process, for, as we'll talk about later, of manifesting, but this is the formula, this is the way it works. And they're all connected. Our mind, our perception of time, and, the three, and our perception of the three dimensions all come out of mind. So, does it matter? Well... Uh, if you don't mind, it don't matter. That has two meanings, folks. If you don't mind, it don't matter. When you mind, when you put your mind on something, it will, sooner or later, come into your experience. Now, it doesn't come in by any kind of magic. It comes in by attraction, where situations come to you. It comes in by ideas of things for you to do in time space. And it comes in by coincidences. Things that just seem to happen. You're thinking about somebody you haven't talked to in a long time, and the phone rings. That's an example that you probably all experienced at one time. When your mind is clear and you're focused on what you want, the whole universe works in concert to make happen what you're thinking about. Now, when you are letting your subconscious do your thinking for you, and it's running around with a billion ideas from the past and hopes for the future and doing all this stuff, then you ask yourself, why is my life so confusing? Well, you haven't taken control of your mind, and it's mattering all over the place. Maybe not the matter that you want. Maybe not the situations that you want. Maybe not the coincidences that you want. So it be behooves us to be able to take care of this stuff. There we have an apple, and an apple is made up of atoms. This is, this is a, an apple's atoms instead of the other way around. Uh, 
atoms are, are the very smallest unit of what we call matter, but atoms in turn are made up of smaller things, uh, neutrons, protons, electrons, and quarks. Well, the science of quantum physics basically studies things like electrons and quarks, these little teeny, teeny below subatomic particles. It studies them and their movement. And beneath them, even smaller, so to speak, are this thing called strings. Strings are just little knots of energy. They're just energy floating all over the place. They don't know where they come from. They go in and out of existence, as uh, uh, Fred Allen Wolf says. Uh, we don't know how they come in, and we don't know where they go when they go out. They're just energy coming in and out of existence, flashing on and off. And yet this energy is configured by something. It might look like this. The whole universe is nothing but this vibrating energy. That's, there's nothing but vibrating energy, although our senses perceive it as solids and liquids and, uh, and situations and all sorts of things, but that's all there is. If we, if, we, if we take a table, if we take anything, and we, we look at it at a, a, an electron microcome, an electron microscope, you will find it's nothing but a bunch of little whirling energy. There's no solid there whatsoever, except in our perception. Uh, Fred Allen Wolf is a physicist. You might have seen him in the, the movie What the Bleep. Uh, he's a neat guy. I took a, I took a class from him. Uh, he was giving a one-day seminar down in Miami. And it was the most fascinating thing I ever saw. And I'm going to share with you one little teeny part. Not to make you quantum physicists, but I think this, this conception was so important that it, it showed you how science is actually talking about what the mystics talked about 2,000 years ago. In an experiment that they did, they, there's something called superposition. When there's some of these teeny tiny subatomic particles they can be in lots of different locations. They don't know where. That's what Heisenberg said. We can't track them because we get, we get their location when we can't track their speed. But they know that they're, they're floating around all there, and they don't know how they get solid into being a little particle, how they change from the energy of particle. And what they noticed in the experiments was, and I've made this simple, there's two positions here. There's one of the positions, and then the other position next to it. Um, there would be hundreds of positions, and I'm using this just as a demonstration. And these are big blow-ups. These are teeny tiny things that you would have to look through an electron micro microscope to see. Or in fact, they just really trace their, tra their trails in uh, vapor. What they discovered was that they, the way they found out where something was, was if there was an observer. If one observer was there and looked at the, the place, it came to a certain place where the observer said that's where it was, and that's where it was. Wherever the observer saw it was where it was. It could have been lots of places, but when he focused his attention on it, that's where it was. Now, and then they would take a different observer with the same type of stuff, and he would look, and he would find the same thing in a different place. So they found that it depended on the observer where something was located. Now, we're talking about little teeny tiny particles now. Teeny, teeny things you can't even see with, with your eye or even a big magnifying glass. So they asked the question, what would happen if there was no observer? Let's be sneaky, and let's find out what would happen if there's no observer. So here's what they did. They did this experiment with these uh, little particles going on there, and just like they did the first one, but nobody watched it. They just took a movie of it, okay? And then they had the guys come back 24 hours later, to, and take a look at not the original event, but just the movie of it. And when the first one saw it, guess what? He saw it in one place. And when another one saw it, they saw it in the other place. Now, this is the same thing. And so, they said, something's weird here. You mean what actually happened was, what they saw changed what happened 24 hours ago. Science fact, quantum physics. At the subatomic particle, and, and the, the quantum physicists say at the subatomic particle, what we think is actually controlling what's happening. All the scientists don't agree with this yet. Uh, there uh, was a, a group called the Copenhagen Group, which put out a very paper about it only works at the subatomic level. doesn't work anyplace else, because they couldn't handle this. 
But some of the more itchy scientists, like uh, Wolf and others, are saying, we think it happens much higher than that. And they're doing experiments with seeable objects that are being controlled by thought. Seeable objects. There's all sorts of experiments about how uh, about random generators that, that generate uh, flashes of light, and 50% will be on one side and 50% will the other, other side. And over a long period of time, that's how they, 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 they know it'll come out 50-50. And yet, some people, particularly people who have strong meditation backgrounds, can change it as much as 57-43. And the average person can get it at least 1% average person, by focusing on wanting it to come on one side, will have it come up 51% on the side. They, there are a few people who are reversed, and they've made it, they made it come up the opposite side, which is just as uh, uh, sure as they can tell that their thought is having an effect, only it was reversed. And that's because their energy is reversed. So there's all sorts of scientific evidence, not proof, but evidence, that we are, our thought does have an effect on the things around us, certainly the small things, and as they get bigger and bigger, we're finding out uh, there's amazing things being studied. So I offer all this not as proof that you should do something or be something, but that you should take a different look. You see, quantum physics has been around for 75 years. And its model of the universe is so drastically different than the model of the universe of the Newtonian physics that it's not funny. And yet, all science is based on physics. Physics is the base science. Math goes under physics, but base science is physics, and then the next science is chemistry, and then biology, and then medicine. Well, if quantum physics changes, if physics changes, then you've got to change those other things too. So the way we're going to heal people in the future is going to be with energy, not with drugs. And that's already started. Uh, Fred Allen Wolf said this, there isn't any out there out there independent of what's in here. This is a UCLA physicist, PhD, lots of books, and he made that blanket statement. I think he's correct. What if our thinking not only changes us, which we know, we can show that our thinking can change the way we feel and what we do, but what if it actually changes that reality out there? What if it does? Well, I think if you hang around for 30, 40, 50 years, they will prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Or you could start right now. You could go before proof, if you want, and start running your life as if that were true. You could. The choice is up to you. Those are fingerprints on a photographic plate with something called Carillion photography, and you can see the energy coming out of it. There's energy. You're, you are energy. All of you. This is a representation by people who see uh, energy of what an aura would look like. I've never seen them, but I suspect that they're, I can feel them. And I know that I, I can come up with a person and not even see their face. And if they're in a black mood, I can feel it. Or if they're in a good mood, I can feel it. But I cannot see them. Supposing <clears throat> you had a situation where you were in a, a large room, even larger than this. And we put a huge speaker on one side of the room and a huge speaker on the other side, and we pointed them towards each other and turned them up quite loud with a very strong sound, the same sound coming from both speakers. Do you know that if you stood exactly in the middle, you couldn't hear anything? And the reason you couldn't hear anything is that to the vibrations of the sound, which are at the same frequency, they are as hard as a rock to each other. One blocks the other. They have these sound-canceling earphones. Ever seen those that you can wear and you can't hear anything that's outside? They work on this same principle. So sound can, can stop another sound. And these are just vibrations. And light can do the same thing. All vibrations of the same frequency, when they meet, can cancel each other out. They can act as solids. So our idea of solidity is just that we're vibrating at the same frequency as the stuff around us. That's all. We're vibrating at the same frequency. And so we've, it appears to be solid, and it is. The sound will block the other sound. That's a reality. And we are in a, in a situation where, where if we're pushing our fist against the wall, the wall is going to resist it. According to uh, the quantum physics, most of the time, most of the time, there are, if we can change our frequency, 
We could literally walk through the wall. I'm not teaching that. We're not ready for that yet. I want to give you a demonstration here that will kind of show it. This guy, uh, Ernst Kladney, who lived in the, uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, was a musician and a, and a physicist. And he discovered that by, playing, by putting sand on a plate and playing certain notes, that the sand took shape based on the vibrations of the note. And it took different shapes with different notes, different vibrations. And this is an actual experiment done in that, and you can see how it works. Every frequency has its own pattern. And literally, I believe that that's how thought works. With certain patterns of thoughts, we create certain types of events. And guess what? Joyous thoughts bring. Joyous events. And guess what? Worried, concerned, upset, angry, critical thoughts bring. The opposite. So what do you, what do you want to form in your life? It, what, do you, what will you hold in your mind to create what you want in your life. How much time will you take practicing, taking away the power of the subconscious to control your life, changing those beliefs, and being willing to control your own thoughts? It's one of the reasons we're having you read that book about emotions, because the ability to switch in midstream, right when you get into a, a negative emotion, and switch right away is very important, because as you do that as a habit, the new thinking becomes the new habit. Whenever you are looking for proof whenever you're trying to find out what's happening. It's not out there. There are no answers out there. None. There's nothing out there you need. Everything you need is inside. When Josh, you all know who I mean by Josh? Uh, when Josh was asked to do signs, that's what they called him back in those days, he said no. He wasn't going to do science. He wasn't going to show him mir the miracles. They want proof. And he did that for a very good reason. Because if they had accepted what he did based on seeing a proof, they never would have integrated it. The only way you can find about, out this stuff is to do it yourself. Can't let, if, if science comes along and proves this 100% tomorrow, it isn't going to do you a bit of good until you employ it on your own. He, everybody is looking for signs, and there are lots of signs out there. I see all sorts of things. People say, this is a sign of that, this is a sign of that. The problem with signs is not that there aren't any signs, but it's reading them. Sometimes it's a little difficult. There are so many signs, and they say so many things, and people say, well, this means this, and this means this. Nothing means anything. Nothing means anything unless you make it mean that. That's my favorite sign. 
And I spend a lot of time this side. I'm always wishing that maybe it will do this. Doesn't happen. And then there's God's will, your will, the right way. Pooey! God has no specific will for you. As Neil Wall says, there's no blackboard in the sky with your purpose written on it. You get to decide. And you can use the power of God in the worst way or the best way. That's up to you. And if you're using it in the best way and you're worried about somebody else might use it in the wrong way, you're going to create stuff in your reality. Do not worry about that. Don't worry about the man behind the curtain with the smoke and mirrors. Remember in uh, Wizard of Oz pulling all the levers? Don't worry about that. You are creating your reality, and nobody can get in without your permission, conscious or subconscious. And if, you, if you've got a lock on what you're thinking, all that stuff can go on out there, but not to you. Josh says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And he said also this, Know what is in front of your face and what is hidden will be disclosed to you, for there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Don't know what's in the future. Don't know what's in the past. Know what's right in front of you and what it is that you are creating. That's all you need to know. Scientist says it. Josh says it. Let's take a look at this little guy. Here he is on the edge of reality, so to speak. And he comes across uh, what we'll call a negative situation. This is a terrible event happening in his life. Now, ordinarily, he'd struggle and try to change it and do all the stuff on the outside. But what happens is he starts, he sees it, and he takes it in his conscious mind, and what that does is connect to all the bad events he ever had and really messes up his energy. His whole energy changes. He's upset. But he's had this class, and the first thing he does is stop thinking. Right, And then he looks at himself and understands that he's connected to the object. He created it for a reason, to get rid of this stuff in him. And when he's made that connection on the inner, then he starts to change his emotional state. And when his emotional state is changed, the situation disappears without doing anything about it. It is always, if it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to change, it is up to me. It is always my thoughts. Now, it's pretty hard when uh, your purpose was to drain the swamp and you're up to your, you know what, in alligators, to think that these alligators are things that I created. And some people get very upset because you say you're blaming me. No, we're not blaming. We already did blame here. We don't have blame. We don't allow blame. Blame is not something we want or ever, or ever have. We don't have gossip. We don't have any of those things. We simply look at only two things that are out there. They're like a recording of what we're thinking. And we do have to look at the recording once in a while to check ourselves out. So when we look out there and there's a negative event, and we've been praying for something positive, and we've been doing all this work for something we really want, and up pops this negative thing, if we're out of control, we're going to say, oh, this stuff doesn't work. Or how did this happen? I wasn't thinking anything about this. Well, what that is, is something in you that needs to be cleared before you can get what you're asking for. So instead of it being a bad thing, it's an opportunity. It's one, oh, good, this is one of the things I have to clear. And you clear it in you first. And it'll clear up on the outside. And how many of those do you have to do? One, ten, a million? I don't know. But every time they're there, you look at every negative situation and say, ah, an opportunity to clear the junk in my subconscious mind. And you look at everything that's good and say, oh, goody, this is great. Now what's next? I don't stay with the good stuff forever either. There was a uh, samurai, fierce warrior, a man who everybody feared. And he wanted to know what the difference was between being asleep and being awake. And he heard that there was this wonderful teacher monk who knew the answers. So he went to the place where the monk was and he asked the other monks where he was, and they said, well, he's in meditating. And he said, well, I want to see him right now. He, this is a guy who got his own way. He did stuff. And nobody said no to this samurai. And he said, well, I'm going to go and see him right now. And he interrupted the monk. He says, I want to know the difference between being asleep and being awake. The monk looked up, and he said, 
That is the most shabby armor I've ever seen. You are the ugliest person I can imagine. I can't imagine a person being as stupid as you are. Well, the samurai went into a rage and he took his sword and was about to cut the monk in half. And the monk said, now that's being asleep. But the samurai realized what the monk had done. He'd risked his own life to make a point. Tears came to his eyes and he thanked him. And he said, that's what's being awake. And it is for us. We can be asleep or we can be awake, knowing that what's out there is just a reflection of our stuff, good and bad, and that we can change it because we have the ability to control our thoughts. We literally have the ability to control our lives. Your state of desire, in other words, what you want, what you're thinking about, creates the forms that you want in your life. What you want, what you're talking about, what you're focusing on. Your state of being, which is, has to be in line with your desires. If you're desiring good things, you have to have your state of being in a good state, positive state, in order to create them. So it is the state of being that energizes the forms, but it is the state of allowing that permits the formation. And without that last step, and that's where most people screw up, without that last step, without the allowing step, you will not get the things, or you'll get them half, half-heartedly, or only a few of them, but if you really want to manifest, you've got to be in this state of allowing all the time. And allowing is an all or nothing state. You can't say, well, I'm going to allow this, but I won't allow that. Because then you, if you don't allow anything, you're out of the state of allowing. You have to allow the so-called good and the so-called bad because the bad is just there to help you. So you have to allow it. If you resist it, then you're not in the state of allowing and you will not get what you want or not at any reasonable amount of time. Allowing is accepting everything as it is, period. Just accepting it. We've given you this before, and I want you to memorize. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? If it's a bad thing, a terrible thing, what are we going to say together? Isn't that interesting? If it's a wonderful thing, what are we going to say together? Isn't that interesting? Treat those two imposters as the same, as Kipling would say. Because they're just events. And you want more of the good events? Good. You have to have a few of the negative ones to find out what you don't want. But that's okay. But they should never bother you. They should never upset you. They should never, ever be in your way. So if you are willing to get into this state of allowing, then you can call forth that magical genie and get Your the wish is my command. It is a power that's meant for you. I bless you all.